That's why everybody just refers to me as Matt J. Um, just to give you a quick background on myself, I've uh, been in the uh, automotive automation business for about 30 years now. Uh, I've had different roles in my career, starting off as a uh, an applications engineer for a laser manufacturer, uh, worked my way through project management, sales, ran my own group for, for quite a while, uh, building custom automation. Uh, and now I am uh, responsible for two different business units inside KUKA Robotics. Uh, those business units are the Advanced Welding Solutions, uh, which is a fancy term for our friction welding business, and also our casting uh, product line. So let me just get going here. All right, so just to give you a quick agenda on what we're going to talk about, um, I already did my quick introduction. I'm going to give you a history of friction stir welding. Uh, I'll also talk about the friction stir welding tooling. And in this case, when I say tooling, I'm specifically talking about the consumables used in the process, not the fixturing. Um, we'll talk about the friction stir weld joint itself. I'll show you um, a few examples of what uh, solutions could look like, and I'll give you an overview, a comparison uh, between this technology and some of the other technology that's on the market. Um, so to start off with, friction stir welding was originally developed by uh, the Welding Institute in England in about 1991. At that point, they applied and were uh, given a patent on the process. Um, so the process in very basic terms consists of a, uh, a rotating probe or pin that is pushed into a stationary material. Um, when the rotating pin or, or, or probe contacts the stationary material, you start to generate heat through friction. Uh, we use that heat to raise the material temperature up to what is referred to as a plastic state. This is below the melting point of the material. So the material never goes into a liquid transition. It stays in this jelly-like consistency. Once we generate that, uh, that, let's call it a puddle, we then use the motion system to push that puddle uh, along the weld path uh, while maintaining pressure on top of the part. Uh, what this does is it produces an extremely high quality weld uh, that has excellent mechanical properties. And we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward. So why is KUKA in this business? We're uniquely positioned uh, because we have a, an over 50 year history of building industrial robots. So we have a full range of robotic products. And then we also have for the last 50 years built friction, rotary friction welding equipment. Uh, I think a lot of people on this call probably don't realize that we're in that market. These rotary friction welding uh, machines uh, look like a, a large CNC lathe. Uh, they work very similar to a friction stir welding process, but only in, in one axis of motion. Uh, they're used throughout the automotive industry and uh, the electronics industry, oil and gas, uh, welding hydraulic cylinder rods together. Uh, drive shafts are a, a, a major um, application for friction welding. Um, electrical connectors or contacts for the, uh, the EV world are a new uh, upcoming market for that product. So if you look at KUKA's history with friction stir welding, as I said, the Welding Institute had a patent on friction stir welding. That patent expired in the early uh, 2000s. When that happened, KUKA put their foot into the, into the pool uh, of combining friction stir welding and robotic applications together. Um, we started off in, in the late 2000, 2000s, I guess you'd call it, uh, with um, R&D systems doing work for the automotive and for the aerospace customers. Those um, increased in acceptance and our first major application uh, was for welding um, a computer tablet together. It was an aluminum tablet. We had 50 systems in place that were welding the outside of that tablet together, an aluminum constructed tablet. 
Um, we then continued to optimize this process with other partners like TWI, the Welding Institute, like ESOB. At one point, we were very close um, and that allowed us to, to expand into other areas like automotive, uh, the train uh, industry, aerospace. These are all areas that are, are friction stir welding is pretty common. Uh, if you look at what we have going on right now, uh, this is still in its infancy, but uh, with the EV push, we're now well over 200 systems in, in the field uh, worldwide. Um, with large systems welding automotive components right now here in North America. So the process in very layman's term, what ends up happening here in the first picture, uh, you see we have this rotating probe. Uh, the rotating probe can, can be manipulated in two different ways. We can either rotate the entire probe assembly or we can keep the the outer shoulder stationary and rotate just this small pin sticking down in the picture on the right. So in either uh, case, the process still happens basically the same. We rotate the part or the pin, we push that pin down uh, into the stationary material. Uh, we're capable of pushing or applying up to 10 kilonewtons of force in a vertical axis uh, with our robot. Once that material heats up to that plastic state, which is this warm up time we talk about here, dwell time, we then transition that part or that probe across the stationary part along the weld seam. And when we get to the end of the weld, we uh, retract or basically move the robot in the opposite direction to pull it out. This seam that you see on the bottom represents a, a, a very typical example of what a friction weld looks like. Uh, on the very left-hand side, you'll see the start of the weld, which um, will not have any defect on the surface of it. Uh, we do get some slight burr along the edges of the, the weld itself. Uh, depending on which rotating process we use, we can either minimize that or, or have an adverse effect on that. As the weld moves to the right, at the very end of the weld, we will uh, have a small divot that is uh, equal to the size of the pin when we retract. So it's very important that we we deal with that um, that spot at the end of the weld in our in our welding process and our actual application. So I'll show you that a little bit later on. Once we are in the welding process itself, we are controlling many parameters inside the robot. We're controlling on the far left here, axial force, how much pressure we're applying to the, to the part while we're welding. We actually tilt the probe and, and in a push orientation. Uh, so we control that, that tilt angle. We control the welding speed. We control the speed and direction uh, of the rotation. Um, we also are very cognizant of what we call the heel plunge depth as we tilt the the probe and we start the to transition across the weld seam, that back end of the probe is compressing the uh, material underneath uh, the, the probe itself. So that's a critical parameter to us. So we wanna make sure that that's correct. Um, and if we go into a, a situation where we're doing like an edge fillet weld, uh, we can actually tilt on an angle and weld that thing, you know, on like a 45 degree angle. What type of joints are possible with friction stir welding? Well, pretty much all your major joints, butt joints, lap joints, a combination or a hybrid of a, of a lap and a butt joint, uh, T joints, corner joints, inside and outside corner joints. What's important about this is the actual fixturing is different and critical in every one of these applications. So you just can't throw a, um, a corner joint underneath the friction stir weld, you have to have it fixtured properly or your results will not be uh, satisfactory. What type of materials are uh, applicable to the robotic friction stir weld market? One of our limiting factors for robotic friction stir welding is the amount of forging force or how much pressure we can apply with the robot. 
So we use a 500 kilogram robot that has a, a specially engineered uh, transmission to dual transmission to make the robot as rigid as we possibly can. Uh, that way we apply the maximum amount of force. So we can put about uh, 10 kilonewtons of force on the on the, the weld joint itself with that 10 kilonewtons where we can very um, successfully weld basically any type of aluminum from 1000 series up to 8000 series. We can weld cast uh, aluminum components. We can weld copper to aluminum. Um, so if you look at this matrix here, we show different material combinations uh, with the horizontal being one material, the, the vertical uh, being the second where they intersect, you'll see uh, a circle with a check mark that indicates that we've done validation testing on that material combination and we feel it's successful. If it has just a check mark with no circle, based on our test, we feel it's success that we can do it successfully. We just haven't finished our trials with it. Uh, if it's um, no check mark at all, then we're, we're still in uh, development work on that. So now I'm going to show you a quick video of the welding process itself. Um, this is what we had set up in our demo lab. Um, one thing I want to point out, let me see if I can go back to the beginning here. And I'll stop it. Okay, if you look at the cell construction right now, one thing that is important is during the welding process, we, we do not produce any type of an arc. Uh, so we do not need to have weld curtain around the outside of the cell. This black curtain that you see here is purely just for the video. So we can get better contrast and you can get a better view of it. Um, we do not generate any fumes during the welding process. So there's no reason to have a hood on top of the cell. Uh, there's no fume extraction needed. We're not spraying sparks and, and uh, material around the outside of the cell. So it's a very clean and quiet process. So this is welding a, a battery tray uh, right now, a cooling tray. Um, it's aluminum in a lap joint configuration. So you can see the weld very smooth. Um, there's no major hump or, or um, upset in the weld itself. Um, once the, the part is actually welded, you can put your hand right on top of it. Uh, the, the bulk aluminum behind it sucks the heat out so quickly that uh, there's basically no temperature change on the outside of the part. In this application, we're actually indexing uh, some clamping uh, fingers out of the way just to give the robot access to go by. And in this application, these are hydraulic clamps. Um, not necessarily needed in all applications. In this application, we felt it was best. Okay, so now let's talk about the tool design. When we say tool design, like I said at the beginning, I'm specifically referring to the consumables themselves. These consumables are housed in this housing right down here, and they basically consist of two different components. One component we refer to as the shoulder, one uh, component referred to as the pin or the probe. Um, these things change during um, application development during that time frame where we're trying to, to optimize our welding parameters, we can swap out uh, these components based on material thickness and type, uh, what the joint configuration is, how much stirring, air quotes, that we, is required in the weld puddle itself to get a good weld, um, what kind of surface quality the customer is looking for, and we optimize all of those to minimize the risk of, uh, of breaking a, a pin or a probe. 
So this just shows some examples of what these pr uh, probes or pins and shoulders will look like depending on the application. We have everything from a, a, a simple uh, a cylinder uh, all the way up through some very complicated designs. And in some scenarios, we, we, we have engineers back in Germany that are actually designing new pins for the application if required. But typically we're picking from uh, a standard group of components. And then we have the shoulder itself. Uh, the shoulder itself, depending on uh, what welding process we're using. And when I say welding process, are we spinning the entire shoulder or are we keeping that shoulder stationary and spinning only the pin? Um, those shoulders can change based on those requirements. Just to give you an idea, a typical rule of thumb, these pins will last uh, in the welding operation. We, we in, in an optimized process, we say a pin will last for a kilometer of welding, one kilometer. All right, so I talked about this classic friction stir welding, which is basically a rotating shoulder and pin, or the um, the stationary shoulder friction stir welding, where we keep the shoulder stationary and rotate the pin. Uh, I'm sorry, one thing, the benefits are the classic friction stir welding may give us slightly higher welding speeds. It may give us uh, a better ability to, um, to handle mismatch in the parts if there is any, um, but the, Solid state friction stir welding gives us a much more accurate process and a cleaner process. So this little uh, cartoon shows you roughly what the um, the diameter of the shoulder would be in the classic friction stir welding, which is roughly uh, just over a half inch in size uh, with our nugget uh, being welded underneath there. Then we get our, our uh, thermally mechanically altered uh, zone and our heat affected zone. But then if you look at our uh, stationary shoulder, it's significantly smaller. It's basically two thirds of the size, but it gives us uh, a weld that is roughly the same diameter or the same, the nugget roughly the same width with a slightly better uh, heat affected zone. So what are the advantages of both? Um, the classic friction stir welding has the tendency of developing a a slightly larger burr uh, that would in some situations need to be removed where the stationary shoulder improves that. The geometry uh, of the actual part that you're welding needs to be considered because the, the shoulder itself is larger on the classic compared to the stationary. Um, the load on the surface um, with the classic is much more critical in our process parameters, but it can be adapted inside of our our uh, stationary shoulder. So typically we try to encourage most customers to go into the stationary shoulder. Uh, we feel it's just overall, it's a better process. Let's talk about the weld joints itself, the properties of the weld joint. One thing that is, um, that is commonly known is that the friction stir weld itself, especially in aluminum, is an incredibly high quality weld. It is very smooth on the top surface. It has excellent mechanical properties. In most cases, mechanical properties that reach, or in some cases exceed the, the, the base material. Um, there's a, a heat affected zone that since we keep the weld under pressure during the welding process, we end up constraining the grain growth of that weld. And since we have a smaller, tighter grain, we have better um, uh, fatigue and fracture uh, uh, test measurements coming off of it. So the behavior of a friction stir weld, incredibly reproducible. It's very consistent once we get the parameters set up. So you don't have things that come out of it like porosity. You typically don't have, there's no possibility for a pour to generate since during the welding process, we're putting 10,000 kilonewtons of pressure on it. Any oil on the surface, ceramic uh, that would be generated from aluminum oxide 
it all gets forced out the side of the well, it doesn't exist. So high quality, very strong. This just gives you an example of what a typical weld cross section would look like. This is a, a butt joint where you can see, you know, clearly the um, the nugget itself is that is forming directly underneath the the pin itself or around the outside of the pin. You'll see the stir uh, action as it, as we're rotating during the weld, um, and you'll see the heat affected zone coming off the side. This is a exploded view to show you more detail of what the grain structure itself looks like. Uh, you can see the large crystalline structure that we have um, on the base material. And then when you get into the weld itself, you can see how small the, uh, the grain growth is because we're holding that under pressure. I included this picture in the, in the presentation just to show you uh, typical weld width that you get. I think it's important to understand that, that in this material stack up, we have a weld width of, of over four millimeters. That weld width is critical if you're trying to do a sealing application, like you're sealing off a water channel in a water cooling plate. Um, typically, the friction stir weld process is, is competing against a laser hybrid process. And if you look at the weld for a laser hybrid, that is a, uh, a keyhole weld. So it can be very deep in penetration, but very narrow. So the interface width of the weld is extremely small where we have a very wide weld. And typically we, uh, we have very few problems trying to seal off a material. So if you look at this process, compared to other joining technologies. Like I said, we compete against laser a lot. We compete against arc welding occasionally. Sometimes we compete against laser hybrid where it's laser and arc combined together. Uh, but if you look at these two technologies compared uh, to each other, we have um, significantly reduced heat input into the part compared to an arc weld. Laser is a different uh, process completely. Arc weld is a conduction mode weld. So you put a lot of heat on the surface. Uh, not a lot of heat goes into penetration where laser is kind of just the opposite. It's very deep, but very narrow. Um, so arc welded assemblies have a lot of distortion, a lot of warp. We see less of that. Um, we, we can confidently weld dissimilar materials together. Since we never go to a molten state with the aluminum, when we weld it to a dissimilar material, we do not alloy that material. We don't create a new alloy. If we're welding aluminum to copper, we're forming a unique um, bond inside the joint, but it is not creating a new alloy. If you look at at uh, other welding processes, you develop, um, uh, you have to alloy into a different material with those different materials uh, may not, you know, like to work together and you end up getting cracks inside the joint. So in some situations we can weld different materials together. And in the rotary friction weld market, we do that all day, every day. Uh, we weld steel and aluminum together in the rotary friction weld market. Copper to aluminum is not a problem. Um, some things that are really important when you compare this technology to competitive technologies, we have no filler wire in our process. It's a completely autogenous weld. So we don't have the, um, the cost of that filler wire. We don't have um, the, uh, the, the wire feed system. We don't have uh, the, um, the people who have to purchase that material on the outside. So the just by eliminating the wire feed and there's no shield gas, removing that keeps our costs very competitive, okay? We don't produce any smoke, so we don't have an exhaust system. We don't have a weld flash, so we don't need an enclosure around the outside of it. In laser, you have a very expensive, light tight enclosure to protect people walking by from, from uh, you know, getting exposed to a, a random laser beam. We don't have that. 
you can literally just put a uh, safety fence up around the outside of our cell and anybody can walk by. And in most cases, you can barely hear that the cell's running. Uh, another thing that's um, that's important is we can weld in all positions. What I mean by that is if you look at uh, an arc welded process, you have to keep that part in a horizontal or flat position. Uh, in our situation, we can weld vertically, we can weld upside down, we can weld in any welding position as long as we have a fixture that can handle the force that we're putting on it. Uh, this is just some old information that shows a comparison between laser MIG and friction stir weld. Um, it was done a few years ago in Germany, but uh, I think it does show uh, some good information about uh, the efficiency of the process. Um, you know, where if you look at a laser process from an efficiency standpoint, uh, they typically run around 60%. Um, I have more data that I can show you to validate that. Where our process, we typically run 90, 95% of efficiency of electricity, weld or uh, actual energy efficiency of the process. Just reading through this. All right. The uh, this next slide shows some mechanical properties of a weld comparing the um, the friction stir weld to other processes. If you look at this graph here, the circles with the plus marks represent uh, the base material properties for a fatigue. This is fatigue uh, fatigue testing. Um, so what they basically do is they flex the part back and forth. Uh, they can vary the number of cycles that they flex before the part fails, or they can uh, increase the amount of force they use on each one of the, the cycles to see if they can drive failure into the part. Uh, so base material is it would be our baseline. The next line down is our friction stir weld line. So it's the closest to baseline compared to E-beam. E-beam is very similar to laser from a property standpoint uh, and um, to, to TIG. Uh, this same series of tests, but only looking at tensile test, uh, again, uh, the friction stir welding comes out closest to base material for tensile tests when compared to other processes. Um, micro hardness. Sorry about that. Micro hardness. Um, again, the base material has a Vickers micro hardness of 140. Laser's closest that we can get to that, or friction stir welding is closest to that. So on all of these tests, friction stir welding ends up driving a result closest to the base material. Now in this one, we're actually looking at impact resistance. Um, so this is with a typical Sharpie test. You can see that the base material is this middle line here and the friction stir welding outperforms the base material um, up to two times stronger. And this is because of that Re, uh, the reduced grain size in the weld joint itself. This is just an example uh, showing a friction stir weld versus a MIG weld in a uh, butt joint configuration. Obviously, this is an older picture. If you look here in the, the bottom left-hand corner, there's what some of you, the young guys might not realize, but that is a, a floppy disk. That was before they had thumb drives. So for us old guys. Uh, all of these things um, will give you benefits in the design and operation of the machine. Uh, from a creation of new products, it gives you the flexibility because of the, the high weld uh, quality. Uh, it gives you the ability to design parts with different material com uh, combinations. Since we're not adding a filler wire to our, pro to our process, uh, there is a weight savings compared to, to uh, other processes, competing processes. We have very low energy consumption. There's significantly less pre and post uh, processing. In a lot of laser applications, you have to um, ensure that you have uh, very finely controlled edges on your part so that you can repeatably hit that. Um, we have a much wider weld, less, less susceptible to those kind of things.
Um, our process is very repeatable and I would love to see uh, actual production data to compare scrap uh, uh, and rejection rates because I believe ours are significantly lower. So I've talked about the benefits uh, of the process, but there are some limitations of the process. One limitation, as I mentioned, it's the amount of force that we have to apply on the weld joint during the, uh, the welding process itself. So similar to, let's say, uh, uh, a roller door hemming system, uh, you have to build a fixture that can withstand that force. So your fixture cost is gonna be a little bit increased to withstand this process. Um, the welding depth or the penetration depth of our welding process, uh, we can get to about eight to 10 millimeters with aluminum alloys. Uh, that is purely a, um, a result of how much pressure we can put down on the part. If we uh, adapted this process to a um, even larger robot than our 500 kilogram, we'd be able to drive deeper weld penetrations. We just haven't done that yet. All right, so now when you look at the friction stir weld as a solution or uh, how you would apply it to your actual product, the very basic solution that would be required on every application would be our robot itself. On the end of the robot, you can see it mounted on the wrist is our spindle with our consumable tooling. Uh, what's not shown in this picture is the robot controller that also has a hydraulic power supply and a pneumatic system in integrated inside it with a water cooling system. Outside of that, we can develop your welding process for you. We can design new friction stir weld consumables if those are required. Uh, if we were asked to, we'd be happy to design the fixturing, the cell around the outside of it, and we can work with people for the material handling. So we can supply this in, in three basic configurations. If we were working with an integrator who had an application or they wanted to buy, or someone wanted to buy a cell and put it in their lab, we could sell just the robot with the controller and the, the spindle. So that would be one package that we could deliver to, to uh, a system integrator. They could integrate it into their solution. If a customer came to us with a solution and said, hey, we're looking for a standard cell, we don't have a huge production line, we just need to weld something um, on a low, lower volume, we could supply the integrator with a standard cell where with no tooling. This is out of the box, all the engineering's done, there's safety fence around the outside, we could put roll-up doors on the front. Uh, in this configuration in the middle, we have two different uh, fixture locations. So while the robot is welding on one fixture, the uh, second fixture is available for uh, an operator to come in and swap parts out. Uh, in this third cell, which is a larger cell, to improve throughput, uh, we would have two robots in the cell alternating between two different welding fixtures. Um, this cell could easily be integrated into um, a production line where we would supply that cell to a, a system builder or an integrator. They would build the tooling themselves. They could handle the uh, automation going in and out, take responsibility for that. So by um, selling this as a module, we would think, we'd like to think we could help out the, uh, the integrator base. So what are the advantages of our solutions? Uh, they're easily configurable between one and two robots. Uh, which for most of the applications hits what we needed to do. They can weld either a, a straight seam, a straight line seam. Let's call that a one uh, a one uh, D process. We could go uh, on a flat plane and do a two D process, or we can actually go in three dimensions uh, using the robot um, to orientate a, a a very you know complicated uh, structure. And with the influ uh, with the increase in the the EV market, we're getting a lot of push on all this stuff. It's also one thing that's nice is you control the robot and all the welding parameters inside 
the KUKA uh, teach pendant. There's an inline form that drops down. You change whatever parameters you need to change and you control it there. You do not have to go between the robot and a MIG welding power supply or the robot and a laser power supply. Um, it's all controlled through one place. And we do have um, offline programming with KUKA SIM for this whole solution. Uh, outside of that, we'd be happy to work with anybody on feasibility studies if they're just trying to investigate this welding process. Uh, if they want us to develop welding parameters, we can do that. In certain situations, we'll do prototype welding um, or even low volume production. If a company wanted to make 50 parts as tests, we'd be happy to work on that. Um, we'd be happy to either design or work with someone to uh, design the clamping fixtures. Um, and to integrate the whole process together. So now I'm gonna show you a video of a process that was done in Europe. Um, it is for, uh, again, a battery tray on e-mobility. Uh, so this is a full system that's in production right now. I turned the sound off. All you would hear in the background is some German techno music playing. So, so this cell is set up as a, a sub-assembly going into final assembly. Um, first thing that happens is incoming material uh, comes in. We have a robot with an end effector on it that picks up uh, individual plates and then deposits them on a, a staging fixture for the robots. So it comes down, it pulls parts out of a rack and dunnage, rotates over, loads them into a, um, a fixture. You see two fixture plates, uh, fixture stages right there. It drops the parts off there and presents them to the robot, material handling robot that would then pick up all those uh, components and bring them to the friction stir weld cell. So it comes in with an end effector, grabs all components, um, drops them into the appropriate um, fixture to start the welding process. Now in this scenario, we have four duplicate cells or duplicate fixtures that, the ro that two robots are alternating between. So you can see it here. The robot on the left handles two fixtures, the robot on the right handles two fixtures. The robot in the middle is purely a material handling robot on a seventh axis slide. So once the assemblies are welded, uh, this customer wanted to, re to remove any potential for a burr on the surface. So we put them on a conveyor belt, slide it through uh, what is basically a brush or a belt sander to uh, clean that surface off before it goes into the next operation, which is the marriage operation. And when I say marriage, we are welding that plate that came off as a sub-assembly to the, um, the actual structural components underneath. You'll see that in the video coming up. So at this first station on the bottom, we have um, the incoming subframe coming into the assembly into the station. On the left hand side, we pick up the the individual plate. We in the right hand side, we marry the plate, the floor plate to the frame itself. We pick that up as a subassembly, put it into our weld fixture. And at that point, the robot goes through and welds that that full joint together, completing the assembly. Once the assembly is done being welded, pick up the full assembly. Now in this scenario, we're once again removing the weld burr off the top. We do it differently. We have a rotary brush mounted to the end of a robot, and then we drive that directly over top of the weld seam uh, that we just did just to clean up that surface. Next station will be a quality check, and then from quality check, it goes out uh, for the final racking. OK. 
Okay. Okay. So where do we see this technology being used uh, most frequently? Well, we're definitely seeing a huge influx because of the EV market. It's in battery trays, cooling trays, pack assembly itself. Um, these are more examples of what, now one thing that's very common is that this bottom structure here, the, the structure itself could be welded with MIG, could be welded with laser or other technologies, and we seal the pack together with a, a friction stir weld. more examples now very common to have total weld length so up to 12 millimeters or 12 meters so very long uh, joints running the the robot across the outside seams and back and forth against all the ribs uh, the train industry uh, specifically in europe uh, it's very uh, popular for friction stir weld gantry style systems today uh, what we're doing there is we're taking extruded aluminum sections that butt together and then friction stir weld down the seam to make a complete assembly like a floor to a train. Uh, there's also been systems up to 25 meters long for that. We just put the robot on a seventh axis slide and move it up and down. In some scenarios, we can actually drop off the friction stir weld head or add a second robot to the track. Uh, where we would do drilling and milling operations on the, in the same cell. Um, friction stir welding in aviation, it's been around for a while. It's an area that we don't delve into very much here in North America. Uh, and electrical devices, uh, as we build more advanced um, you know, modules for the semiconductor industry and for the EV market, uh, they're in order to reduce the complexity of the components, they end up making a cast um, bottom plate where they put a, um, a pl for water cooling, put a plate on top of it, and we friction stir weld that together. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is you'll see this area here that looks like a, a racetrack with a circle with a little curly Q hang on the inside. That is how we end our weld to, to hide the potential for a leak with our uh, our divot at the end of the weld. So we just drive around, we'll make a circle and we'll stop the weld in the center of that circle. So the weld around the outside of it um, is hermetically sealed. Whatever happens on the inside is a, a non-issue. So that's it, that's my presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat area, um, but I do want to say on behalf of everyone at Cooker Robotics, thank you so much for attending. Um, this webinar will be uh, available online um, very soon. We will interview you. Industrial Intelligence.